Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hello, it's Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to the Cognitive Podcast here at episode 39. Please be aware that comments are very welcome. Either you comment on our group on Ravelry or at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com. Don't forget that cognitive is spelled C-O-G, the word knit, and then I-V-E. What else? Well, you can add yourself to our listeners map. You can go over and look at my YouTube channel, which is called Dr. Gemma, all one word. And the doctor is spelled out. And there are flash tips about surviving the pandemic. And there are some longer strategy discussions based on the things I most often say in session with patients. In case you're wondering, some of what you hear in therapy. In the meantime, I'm just reviewing all this because I haven't for a while. We're not doing a CFR this year. I have a knit more promise. Well, that we might lure them in if I can do a CFR, but I'm not sure about my listener base right now. I'm not sure if I have listeners who would come. So if you want a CFR, a cognitive fiber retreat, or a cognitive mindfulness and fiber retreat, you should let me know. In the meantime, I'm being hunted by robo accounts. This happens every time I post a thumbs up on the account used by President Biden. (laughs) Some of these people are really virulently crazy. I mean, I don't think you have to particularly like Biden if you don't want to, but I think hunting down people who give them a thumbs up is kind of pathetic. At any rate, that's why I'm not adding people to my social media. So you have to contact me through Ravelry or on the blog at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com. Show notes are always in Ravelry if you want any of these links. Okay, not too much this week. On to the warm thanks. Well, the warm thanks is to the Sunnybank chums. Now there's two groups of them. The small group, we have a tiny group of three of us who occasionally meet on FaceTime or on Zoom, and I'm very fond of them. Uh, Eileen and Joy, they're just really good people. There's a larger group, and this is based on Sunnybank itself. Sunnybank was the home of an American author who wrote dog stories primarily, but not always about what we now call rough collies. His first book about them was Lad, a Dog, which is collected stories, and Lad has never been out of print since 1916. However, the author was a privileged white man of his time, and so the books have had to be edited to make them more acceptable to a more enlightened audience. I've gone through a lot of soul searching about this and I'm not really recommending the author, which is kind of painful because in many ways his works were very formative of my value systems because when I read them I was old enough to go, why is he saying that strange thing about people who don't look like him? Even so, uh, there are many good books in this world and if you read them for your entire lifetime you won't get through all of them. So I allow this to pass in silence with a certain heaviness of heart. However, one thing the writer did was he used certain words and phrases as catchwords. One of them was chum. Chum was an extremely good friend, your best bud, your chum. And so the Sunny Bankers, we all tend to refer to each other as chums. And so I wanted to thank the Sunny Bank chums. I won't be seeing them this year. I'm not getting on a plane to fly six or seven hours each way in the middle of a pandemic. Yes, I'm vaccinated, but yes, it's been about six months. So it doesn't seem particularly wise to me. And I'm going to miss them terribly. Meanwhile, uh, I wanted to thank them for the warmth and support and friendship 
that goes on all year round in the background on the Facebook page and in various other locations. Thank you, chums. Meanwhile, on to what's on my hooks and needles. Well, I finished the jury duty shawl. It came out just lovely as these tend to do. This pattern is free on the Lion Brand Yarn website, and I recommend it as a really easy crochet pattern if you want a good shawl or scarf. The pattern as I did it and as it's written is for a triangular shawl with an edging. The main pattern is easily memorized. It's basically crochet one stitch in double crochet followed by a chain stitch. That's pretty much what you're doing. There's occasional variations at the ends of rows and every fifth row, the whole row is simply double crochet. But this is very easy. It's easy to understand, it's easy to memorize, and it's easy to get the logic of the pattern so that you don't have to keep consulting the pattern. This is one of my handful of go-to patterns. I really believe that you should have a few patterns in your head that when in doubt and when apart from your pattern list, you can just crank out something. So I'm in Santa Barbara. Oh, this has now been about three years. On my birthday, pouring rain, we find the lone yarn shop that has survived at the very far end of State Street. We walk in and there's this breathtakingly beautiful raw silk yarn. I believe it was kind of a light fingering weight by Ella Ray, rustic silk as they called it. And it was really pretty and I thought it was a great souvenir of my birthday. So I bought it and a hook and I sat in the car just hooking a nice little cowl. That's the kind of thing you want to be able to do, to just kind of make it work for yourself. And this is one of those easy patterns that you keep in your head so that when you have a spare skein of yarn and you can't think what to do with it, if, as long as you have a crochet hook, you got one of these babies. I think I've made eight or nine of these at this point. We had, years ago, at the Mindfulness and Fiber Retreat out in Camarillo, we had Dizzy Blonde Studio as our wonderful, wonderful yarn provider, and she made special colorways. And I do believe I made those into these shawls as well. I remember one in beach tones. It was just fantastic. She does a beautiful job. I'm a big fan of Dizzy Blondes. At any rate, this is that easy go-to pattern. At the end, if you like, you can add the edging. The edging is simply a pattern of crochet, five double crochets into one stitch. Skip one chain into slip stitch. Sorry, skip one slip stitch, skip one, and repeat. So it's five double crochet in one double crochet from a previous row, row. Then you skip a double crochet in the previous row. Then you slip stitch and then you skip one and you go back to five. Okay, it's a really, this is so easy. It's easily memorized. I'm just reciting it here from memory. This was a gradient yarn from Apple Tree Knits. I have no idea how much yarn was actually in that skein. They said something like 783 yards. It was advertised as a sock weight. It really wasn't. It really was either heavy thread or extremely light fingering, but it worked beautifully. It went from dark pink down to white. Something I would warn you of, I had it caked up and then I didn't use it for seven years and that resulted in weak spots in the yarn. I thought at first it had been mothed, but then I realized it was in with a lot of other yarn, none of which had any evidence of moths and it was wrapped in a cake. And caking your yarn, that is a very tightly wound center pull ball, does put stress on it. So what happened, interestingly enough, was the wool gave way, but the rayon in it held tight. And so I had a continuous strand of yarn, but I'd have some wool fibers kind of rubbed off a little bit. It was a delight to work with. I have more apple tree knits, and I'm looking forward to using it. It was great yarn. and. None of what I'm saying was the fault of the yarn. It was a message. Don't cake your yarn unless you're going to use it right away. Meanwhile, this led to me returning to the really pretty socks. I'm working on sock number two. Sock number one is finished, heel and all. And this is another one of those go-to patterns I keep in my head. My go-to sock is top down, two inches of cuff in one by one rib, followed by five inches in stockinette. I add two rows for the afterthought heel in waist canvas, and then I do a five and three quarter inch foot before I begin the toe decreases 
Then I go back and add the heel, doing the exact same thing I did for the toe. So that's my in my head sock pattern. Again, you want to have a handful of these patterns that you can just use on demand. You also want to keep your phone charged so that you can look at your Ravelry projects and remind yourself of these patterns and look up your notes on them. Even so, this is a really easy, fun pattern. This is just strikingly beautiful yarn. It's passport yarns. The Wild Lettuce Shawl has gotten no love. We are on the second half of the knitted on lace edging. It's very, very beautiful. It is a repeat, I believe, of 10 rows. Each row is 25 stitches. So, you know, sing along with me. If I did one repeat every day, two weeks from now, this thing would be done. Do I do one week repeat every day? No, this could have been done a month ago. Still, I love it. It's very pretty. I'm just not really into shawl knitting. Now, I may have to get into shawl knitting because I have an offer to help me block shawls. So I suddenly realized maybe I do want to return to the wild lettuce. I'll come back to that in the blather. Twin faces vest. Okay, I whined. There was no shame. I called her and I said, where is the vest? Now, Twin Face is very particular about receiving birthday presents exactly on our mutual birthday. I said, if you don't send that thing back to me, you can't get it for our birthday. And then I held up the cheat, which is I have this other really rotten gift. I mean, it's not rotten, but it's pretty unexciting. And it's like, look, I'm going to send this to you so you get something on our birthday. So you're happy. But if you don't get the vest on our birthday, this is your fault, not mine, because I could finish it in time if I had it. True, it would interfere with the wild lettuce shawl, but I live with these things. At any rate, she swears she's going to try and send it to me. She's been half worked to death at her job. It's not her fault. And they've even been working her on weekends because salaries. Ugh. Anyway, so poor thing. She's really trapped on the job right now. She likes her job, but it's push time for her. But anyway, that's what's going on with Twin Faces Vest. I'm getting desperate. I was going to add an inch to the body before I started the front and the back and then the edgings on the neckline and the armholes. I'm at a place now of like, I get that thing, I'm just finishing it without adding to the length because she's making me crazy. The temperature blanket is caught up, but it is trapped in orange land. It is unbelievably warm here. It's been in the high 90s. We cannot break through into the rouge, which is 101 to 110. Yesterday we might have. I'm going to go review, but I've got all these different temperature sources and one of them says, no, it was only 99 up at the farm. Ah, because I'm just doing nothing but orange. I'm going to be grateful for that. I guarantee probably in another week when it goes back into the hundreds. Actually, they're forecasting going back into the 80s uh, later this week. So I'm kind of hoping that'll take me into caution. I want to use up that yarn. I got a lot of caution, a lot of orange, and a lot of rouge. But it's caught up, and it is it's just amazing to me that after eight months of it, I'm still enjoying it, that I really look forward to doing it. Let's see, let's see. I'm not wearing anything knitted, despite the fact I made this beautiful, breezy, crocheted shawl. That's how hot it is. So let's move on to Dizzy Blondes. I am trapped eternally in the beautiful merino, pin-drafted, huge. I bought 16 ounces of it from Moro Bay Fleece Works, and you can find the link in the show notes. It's so beautiful. It's taking forever, even on an electric wheel. So I have a lovely picture of the second huge bobbin of it sitting on my electric eel 6.0 with my eternal coffee in my beautiful poly mug sitting next to it. And that leads us to a strategy. The strategy is about letting go of judgment. And this goes hand in hand with what I talked about last episode, which was Teflon Mind. Teflon Mind is like a snapshot photograph. Like in it, from minute to minute, just let things slip off your mind. Compared to that, judgment and letting go of judgment is more like a video, that it takes more time. It's an ongoing process. It's not just a minute by minute thing. You have to really make it part of your philosophy. Letting go of judgments is related to the Buddhist concept of detachment. And again, detachment doesn't mean you don't love. It just means you, you have Teflon mind. You try not to let the bad things stick. At the base of all this, as I talked about last time, is this idea that you own yourself. You own your mind. 
And so you have to take control of your property, which means you can control what's in your head. You can let go of bad feelings. You can choose to experience good things. It takes a lot of work. Look, Buddhist monks work on this full time. It's their job. I mean, this take, can take a lifetime. So you have to be patient with yourself. But letting go of judgments is a very liberating strategy. And you'll find it all over the place, by the way. The wise of our cultures have been telling us about this for millennia, literally. And you also have to be realistic that there are judgments you are going to make. For example, I am a psychologist. I have to assess people for mental illness. So I am judging. I am judging whether I believe them. I judge them whether they're... I, I try not to judge if they're telling me the truth, but I try to be realistic about do I believe what they're saying? And if I don't, why are they motivated to say it this way to me? As opposed to saying, you're lying and I don't like you. That happens, but it's really fairly rare. Most of the time when people are giving you bad ideas, they either believe what they say or they believe it should be right. And that's about fairness and, that, and that's a whole other thing. That's radical acceptance. Okay, so, you know, I'm a psychologist. You can't negatively judge your patients. I mean, they came to you because they're having mental health problems. And that's kind of part of the whole deal of letting go of judgment. If you're a professional caregiver in some way, you let go of judgment all the time. If you're a teacher, if you're a nurse, even I guess if you're a lawyer, you have to sort of take your clients as they are, even if you don't believe them. But again, we work constantly at being neutral, at letting go of the judgments. And when you do that, you become more successful at confronting inaccurate ideas when you must. In my job as a psychologist, I can't speak for everybody else. But it's important to realize that this is a strategy many of us are using in our professional lives. It isn't that huge a step to bring it into your personal life, to begin to think about your personal relationships in the same way. And it's certainly much more deserved that when you love somebody, you don't want to be sitting in judgment on them all the time. Going back to the wise people have been telling us this. Well, it's part of Buddhism. It's detachment. I'm willing to bet it's involved in Hinduism, although I don't know the dogma enough. Certainly in Christianity, there's a great moment in the New Testament where Jesus says, um, judge not lest you be judged, for the standard that you use will be used against you. I kind of like that a lot because it's a, the whole thing is often not quoted. You often hear judge not lest you be judged, but you actually have to do a certain amount of judging. If you're a parent, you have to decide, is this kid, your kid is interacting with safe for your kid? Are they a good person? Are their parents good people? I mean, there are judgments you're gonna make throughout life. So I think it's that second part that you will get judged by your own standard that's very key that when you judge somebody else, you are giving them permission to judge you. And various groups interpret that statement in various ways. I've actually had someone say, no, I'm supposed to judge in my faith because I'm supposed to be judged. And it's important because I'm good enough to be judged, which I find scary. <laughs> I, I really do. I believe all humans are fallible and humans will cover the truth or misrepresent it for many reasons. And I'd be very nervous being judged all the time. I'll be honest. But the point is, that whole statement is key because when you're judging people, you're inviting judgment of yourself and you'd better do a darn good job to live up to that. I'm kind of more in the Buddhist school here where I really just like the idea of detachment. The older I get, the more I like just letting go, period. Because I also think when you can let go of this, you have more peace internally. You're not taking up your energy and brain space with thinking about people who probably are not worthy of your energy or brain space. People who are mean do not deserve space in your head. Your head can be doing wonderful things, can be planning vacations like I'll be talking about in the blather. It can be cooking and baking. It can be loving your children. Why do you want some jerk in your head who you don't like? You need to just push that out of there. So that's letting go of judgments. One of the great metaphors for it is storm clouds, that judging is like a storm cloud in your head. How much rain do you want? You want to really push the storm cloud out. And your urge to judge should be seen that way. It's a passing dark cloud in your mind. 
and you can just ride it out or you can push it out. But the idea is you want it out of your head. It's only darkness in a negative way. And that's all a big part of mindfulness. Mindfulness is if I'm making the current moment the best it can be, then I don't want to cloud it with negative stuff like angry judgment. Speaking of the current moment, it's 10.34 a.m. on Thursday, August 5th, 2021. Just wanted to say that. And so my job in terms of mindfulness is to make 10.34 a.m. the best possible moment. If I want to enjoy this moment, that means when I have negative urges, I'm going to be using urge surfing. I'm going to just not drown in the tidal wave of my negative urges or my negative judgments. Instead, I'm going to surf them. I'm going to ride them out knowing they will pass. And that's the best I can do for this moment if I'm having problems. If I'm not having problems, I'm certainly not going to waste this moment on a negative judgment or negative feelings or bad things. Okay, moving on to put a lid on it. Well, it's pudding season, which means it's really too hot to cook. So my, my range is very limited. I remember the good old days when I was canning and making jellies, and I really miss doing that. However, it's a lot cooler in the kitchen. I may have found a source for organic tomatoes, which would take me back to canning a lot of salsa because we really go through salsa. And salsa is very easy to make keto. And it's amazing stuff if you live in Southern California. It goes on everything. However, it's pudding season. That is, it's too hot to cook. So you need all your no-bake recipes. This week, I also gave in a little bit. I used my keto bread mix from Fox Hill Kitchens. And that's a good hot weather thing because what you do is late at night, you mix it all up and then you cover it in a bowl with a towel in a warm place, which is everywhere right now in August in the desert in Southern California. And then you let it rise. And then the next morning you just pop those babies in roll shape onto a baking sheet and you bake them for like 50 minutes and then you have bread rolls if you're keto. So you can make sandwiches, which is lovely. In the meantime, puddings. I have two puddings of choice and they both look horrible. Keto pudding is not a pretty sight. Why? Because it uses gelatin, animal bone, liquefied, ground up in suspension, okay? So I made chocolate pudding, which is really a keto chocolate cheesecake recipe. This is basically two bricks of cream cheese and a tablespoon of vanilla in a blender. And I like to add chocolate to it. I like to add um, cocoa powder, you know, unsweetened cocoa powder. About, oh, I put about a quarter cup. And you let that go on a low speeded blender or you will be in a mixer. Sorry, a big mixing bowl. I use my KitchenAid. You put it at low speed or you will be spraying your kitchen with cocoa powder. And in the meantime, you boil water and you mix that with swerve and a packet of gelatin or a tablespoon of gelatin. I like to use organic grass-fed beef gelatin. I particularly like gelatin because, as weird as this sounds, it's great for keto, but also if you're going to be slaughtering cattle, I like the idea you're using the bones. I like the idea that you're not wasting. At any rate, you mix those things together and then you, when it's, you have to stir it with boiling water in the swerve and gelatin for about five minutes. You really got to stir it hard to get rid of all the gelatin bits. And then you slowly pour it into the mixing bowl where you have the chocolate and the vanilla and the cream cheese. And then you take that bowl and put it in the fridge for 15 minutes, stir it, 15 more minutes, stir it and decant it into pudding cups. And then you put that in the fridge. It needs about another 15 minutes and it sets. So that's one of my favorite puddings. The recipe is in previous shows, so I'm not worrying about it right now. The other thing I made was chia seed pudding. And let me warn you right now, I cannot remember where I got the chia seed pudding either, but it looks horrible. Oh no, I got the chia seed pudding from twosleevers.com. And chia seed pudding on a nice day, it's, it's called, she calls it pandan pudding, but it's great because you get gelatin, you get coconut milk, so you're getting fat and some sweetness, and you get chia seeds, which are a superfood. I mean, it's a really nice, nutritious sort of thing, and it looks like snot. There's no nice way to say it. She uses pandan, which is, I believe, a Philippine flavoring, which I haven't been able to find, so I use vanilla instead. 
So it's this kind of weird vanilla chia seed pudding. And essentially you take the ingredients and mix them up and then put them in the fridge. And the ingredients are chia seeds and boiling water, which I try to leave to sit for a few minutes to let the seeds swell. And then vanilla, swerve, and a can of coconut milk full fat. So this is a really nice keto snack. There's a lot of fat in it. There's a lot of sweetness in it. So anyway, I have my fridge loaded with these puddings right now at my son's request, strangely. He said, why do you not make pudding anymore? And I thought, good point. And hot weather is good. Pudding weather is good, cool dessert. But you want to make sure it's stuff that you're not cooking too much. I'm willing to bet I could make jello with all my gelatin. And yet I have not looked it up. The other thing I'm thinking I need to make again are the bobas made with gelatin, which are a little strange compared to the normal boba that are made with tapioca flour, but that's starch. But I'm thinking I need to make a few bobas as well to drop into the iced teas. Again, these are good keto snacks. These are filling because you're eating fat. And so it's a nice mid-afternoon break, particularly the boba tea. And the boba tea, you can throw those bobas in anything because I've been eating a little too much heavy cream and putting on weight. So I'm cutting back on my heavy cream, but I have to tell you, just really cold iced tea that you make in the fridge, which I have to go do after I'm done here. And that for me is a liter of cold water poured over five tea bags, only one of which is allowed to have caffeine, if any. And I, I do it the sugar by eye. It's less than a quarter cup. But anyway, I just put that all together and put it in the fridge and make iced tea like every other day. And so there's always iced tea on hand and throwing boba into it makes it into a snack for keto people. So that's our put a lid on it here in pudding season. Really what I'm saying is it's too hot to cook season. By the way, those of you with Instant Pots, yeah, this is our time. Instant Pots are insanely great in pudding season that when it's too hot to cook, you love the Instant Pot. And I'm just saying it was great when I was camping. I pre-made all this food in my Instant Pot and took it with me camping to Yosemite and then just heated it up in pans of boiling water from the spring. Really nice. Meanwhile, I'll shoot the Fit Desk Marathon goes forward. I haven't looked at my total mileage. I'm over, well over 200 miles now. I only did about 10 miles last week. This week I've done four. I need to get on the bike today, which should be easy. I have a nice group of patients who really just want to... They're high functioning. They can talk about their problems and interact with me well. I don't have to dig or work too hard with them, which is a good time to be biking while I'm talking to them. So that's going pretty well, but I have to admit I am craving the outdoors for a good run. Unfortunately, it's in the 80s as soon as the sun comes up here, so not going to happen. Another reason I'm missing Sunny Bank, because I miss Runny Bank, which of course is go running in 90 degree weather with 85% humidity because you're crazy but also because it's northern New Jersey and I'm actually bred to that environment and it doesn't bother me like running with 10% humidity in 85 degree weather here bothers me. All right, on to the fluffy books. Well, I have really fallen for the Constable Evans series by Riz Bowen. Sadly, they have really fallen. That they start out very simple and a little bit idiotically simple and they're getting progressively a little darker. They're not terribly dark. But I have to admit, the last few I've been unhappy with. So I've been reading nothing but Constable Evans, which means I finished Evan Can Wait, Evans to Betsy, Evan Only Knows, and Evans Gate. I just finished Evans Gate this morning. So I'm moving on to the next one, which is Evan Blessed, I believe. And there's a link to Evan Can Wait. And if you go to that link, you'll be on Amazon and you can find the links to all the other books. Uh, at the bottom of each page, they have a list of the books in order with links. So I'm enjoying those. After those, I have a few to catch up on. I know I've got a new Flavia Albia on the list, and I bought some very fluffy young adult books, so this should be good. I will say, I try to avoid things about the supernatural. I'm just a little bored of that trope. You know, handsome, sexy werewolves and vampires with no self-control, etc. Um, but I, I, right now I seem to be in a British mysteries, fluffy, lightweight department. I never read things in the 20th century. It's amazing I'm reading the 
Constable Evans books because they are in the 20th century. I usually read historical lit, in case you're wondering. I draw the line at some historical lit. I don't like, and basically, I don't like plots that rely on sexual assault to move the plot along. So that, that rules out a lot of books. I, I really find that as a plot device very tedious and very supportive of the rape culture, so I don't read those. So if you're wondering how I pick my books, empty-headed, fluffy, fantasy, historical, and usually British, because I miss Britain. I lived in Scotland and I really do miss it. Meanwhile, let's get on to something I really like. What I really like is Vinx. And that's V as in Victor, Y, and as in Nancy, C as in Cat, S as in Sam. What is Vinx? It is a monitor for your car. Now you may remember I talked previously about, I think it was called OBD Facile, that it was a little OBD monitor that you can plug into your car to assess your car's health and well-being. Well, to be honest, I liked that a lot and it came by subscription, but I tend to mislay it. I tend to have to look for where that little monitor is. So instead, I went to a monitor that just rides in the car. You plug it into the OBD. It has its own app and it does a lot of really good things. It tells you the car's location. It tells you the car's condition. It can be programmed if you have a teenage driver to tell you when the teenage driver goes where they're not supposed to go or goes too fast. But on the whole, the real advantage of it is, is it's a really good OBD monitor. And I think it's a step up from the other one because instead of losing it, it's just plugged into the port in my car. Where is that port, you say? Well, if you're wondering, it looks like a white oblong disc with pins, computer pins sticking out of it. I don't know how many, nine or 10. And it usually, in my Toyota, it lives in the driver's cockpit very low below the steering wheel and just above the emergency brake, which is at the bottom far left. And you have to look for these things. They're hidden because they're really for a dealership to be able to plug into your car and assess your car's well-being. But my logic is, well, then why shouldn't I be doing that? I really like OBD monitoring. The last time I had a major engine problem, it let me check on what the dealership was telling me. Now we have a dealership that's very highly rated on reliability. And I thought that was a great thing to know. And so sure enough, they told me, I forget what the problem was, but I plugged in the old OBD monitor and there it was. And it was exactly what they said it was. And that really made me feel good about using this dealership. That really increased my confidence. Now it's more about, I have a 15 year old son and my ability to be in contact is often limited by the landscape here. We don't get good transmission. So every now and then, if the boys have been out and I'm wondering where they are, I can either call them or I can just look up where's the car and I get an idea of what they're doing. You know, we're pretty predictable. You know, I can tell, oh, they're at the climbing gym. Oh, they're at the post office. So I really like this and it, there is a subscription. I bought mine on Amazon and I'll put the link there. I have to warn you, on Amazon, they tell you you're paying in advance for a year's subscription. No, you're not. When I got mine for both cars, they made me pay for the subscription when I register the car in the app. So I'm not sure that that's totally honest. However, it's a good price. That the price of the monitor was still a very good price. And then I think it's, I can't remember, I think it's 39 a year for the subscription. I do not like subscriptions. I do not like allowing companies to reach into my bank account that way. So I usually put them on notice that they have to advise me when they're about to renew. And also, I'll be honest, I tend to occasionally run a credit card through the washing machine. I think that's a good thing. I'm just going to say about once a year, I uh, destroy my only two credit cards. One is an Amex, one is an ATM card. And that ends all my subscriptions. So I get to eliminate old subscriptions that way. That if they can't collect from you, they cut you off. And so it's very nice because that encourages them to message me and say, we want to renew. And it also lets me just end subscriptions painlessly once a year. I just end everything and renew what I want to keep. So <laughs> there's a little consumer tip. <laughs> but I do highly recommend the Vinx OBD monitoring 
and tracker. I think it's a really nice thing to have on your cars, and I've got it on both of mine. It's powered by your car. You never need to mess with batteries. It shows you all sorts of things like your car's health, your car's problems, your fuel, your fuel economy, how much your trips are costing you, and your emissions efficiency, and it will also tell you where your car is. It will tell you the problems in your car and if your car is doing okay. So it's a really nice, reliable tool so that you can monitor your vehicles. And that takes us on to the blather. Well, first of all, we ordered a game called Black Brim 1876. It's a mystery game. We thought we would try a weekend game with the family where we all just sit around and play this game. And I said to my husband, let's get some good pizzas and some Diet Cokes and we'll just all sit around for an afternoon and do this game. I'm having a hard time getting the boys interested, so I'll let you know how that goes. But we did get the game. It comes in a big black padded envelope. It's got two parts. So you open the first part, solve the puzzles, and move on to the second part. I'm really looking forward to this if I can get the boys to hold still long enough. In the meantime, Eleanor got her annual massive grooming. There is a picture of her on the notes looking spectacular because she is a phenomenally beautiful dog. She really is. You can see her giving me a filthy look, total collie stink eye, because she's not afraid of the grooming and she likes the groomers. We use a local kennel called Ken Neal and they do a great job and they'll handle big dogs. She just resents being left there. So she is lying there, and coincidentally, there's three big tufts of her hair lying on the floor around her because should have vacuumed before I took the picture. But I think it's Eleanor glowering defiance among her shed hair. And as always, Eleanor looks beautiful. All joking aside, she's in fabulous condition. She's recovered well from the lupus experience on her nose. She's doing fine. She's very rarely medicated just to keep the nose stuff under control. The big issue is to keep her indoors so that her nose doesn't burn because that sets off the lupus. The vet's very happy with her progress. So there's my beautiful nine-year-old girl. There's also a picture of a topiary. When I drove into the kennels, they had set up topiaries next to all of their fence posts. And the topiaries are dogs in various positions. And they're hilarious and adorable. There's one dog that is digging in the ground and you can only see the back half of the dog sticking up out of the ground. It's very, very funny. So I had to show you one of the topiaries. In the meantime, we've lost one of the Sunnybank chums this week, our own Debbie. Debbie had multiple sclerosis and was in a wheelchair the entire time I knew her and started going downhill in 2018. So this was not unexpected and it fortunately was very sudden. But back in the day in 2016, for Sunnybank, you may remember some of you, I crocheted a scarf to be auctioned for the charity that runs the Memorial Trust at the park, the memorial to the author and his collie dogs. And I took a fox stole pattern off Ravelry and I modified it to look like a collie, to look like a very special collie, one of the author's most famous dogs. And I took it there figuring, well, it cost me about 12 bucks to make, so they'll auction it for about 20 bucks and I'll just be happy with that. Nope. Turns out, people went nuts over the collie scarf. In fact, there was artwork by far better artists and creators than me, and they usually auction their stuff for several hundred dollars. Nope. When that scarf came out, it was kind of shocking even to me. I did film it. I have it on video somewhere, the auction, because the artwork didn't get the time of day. Everybody wanted that scarf. It was cheap acrylic with googly eyes. I mean, I did a good job on it, but you know, I had to put legs and ears on it and I put a stripe up its face with, you know, brown markings over the eyes and all that. Well, anyway, the two Debbies, as we used to think of them, got into a bidding war and it got really frantic. Mm -hmm. And finally, one of the Debbies won, not the one in the wheelchair, and she got to $370, at which point the other Debbie said, I can't go higher, but I'll match that if you make me one. So I went home and I crocheted a second one. So both the Debbies had their lad scarves. They were both really good Joes about bringing the lad scarves to Sunnybank year after year 
to pose for pictures with it. And it was amazing how many people wanted to pose with the lad scarves, as they were called, lad a scarf, after the book Lad a Dog. And Lad a Scarf made his way into some pretty strange places. When they were giving the informative program talks that they give every year about the writer, at one point, one of the great artists, because we have several really good artists associated with Sunnybank, and one of them, Kathy DeGeorge, actually included the Lad a Scarf when she was talking about various artistic interpretations of the author's books. And she said there's even a crocheted version of Lad which got a roar of approval from the crowd. <laughs> so anyway, Debbie, uh, the Debbie who recently died, who died this past week, she got the second lad scarf. And she posed with me and with the head of the Terhune Foundation in all sorts of pictures with the first scarf that the other Debbie had won. Everybody posed with that scarf that year. I mean, I must have about 15 pictures of people posing with lad wrapped around their neck. People just couldn't get over it. So the next year I made Lad's Mate. I made a lady scarf, which went to one of the chums for a generous donation. And then I made a Grey Dawn scarf for one of the women who's a big Dawn fan. And he's a dog, Grey Dawn. And she made a big donation. And then I moved on to making hats. And you bet the first buyer was Debbie. The, you know, the lady who passed this week, that Debbie. That I made a hat last time I went to Sunnybank in 2019. I made it on the plane. It was the very famous Fair Isle hat of the herd of sheep standing on grass with a dark skyscape above them with stars. And some intelligent person redid that pattern so that there was a blank spot in it and you could put in border collies. Except how can you tell what breed it is? If you put a dog there, it's a dog. So I said, well, these are rough collies, and I offered to customize it on the spot because I was doing back stitching to embroider on the collies, you know, as you do. And so Debbie won it, and she gave directions which dog she wanted on it, and the night of the auction, I sat there for the rest of the auction, and I embroidered on the collies. And I do have a picture of her wearing it that she sent to us after she received it in the mail because she couldn't be there in 2019 because she instead decided to put her Sunnybank money into buying another collie puppy, which is a mark of good mental health in my book. So that's the story of Debbie. And what I brought home this week was how valuable our work is. That of all the things I've thought of when I've made a craft project and donated it to a charity or given it to a friend or whatever, the thing I never thought about was what a comfort it is to me when that friend is lost to us to realize that she was able to enjoy my craft work. And I keep thinking all week, how wonderful, how wonderful that Debbie wore that scarf for five years, how wonderful that she wore her collie hat for almost two years, how wonderful that my craft work improved her life and gave her happiness, how wonderful. There's not a lot of appreciation for handmade work in our current culture. Most people think of it as cheap. They think it looks better from a factory or from a Walmart or whatever. And it's very sad because handmade work allows for a lot of personalization and a lot of uniqueness. And yeah, not all handmade work is going to be high quality. But oh, hello, Eleanor. Yes, we are talking about Sunnybank. But even so, the lattice scarf was good enough to auction several times over, in fact, and it gave my friend a lot of happiness in her lifetime. And so I think it is really wonderful that I was able to contribute to my friend's happiness. And I like to think that as her health went downhill, she was getting increased pleasure from the little things like warm woolly hats with collies on them and a scarf she could wrap around her neck and think about all the sunny bank chumps. So please, now more than ever, when we're all separated by pandemic, do not overlook the value of your crafty and personalized gifts. It was very important to me as the crafter to see on the Sunnybank pages when they announced her passing, the pictures that were posted were of her wearing the scarf I made for her. I don't know if there's any higher compliment than that. Finally, Minerva gets the last word. Well. I was reading a book by E.L. Nesbitt. I think it's E.L. I keep forgetting her second initial. The woman who wrote The Railway Children, 
which is a children's classic in Great Britain. She has a wonderful book called The Dragon Tamers, and I heard it on the Calm app, and so I downloaded it. And I'm not going to do spoilers, but one of the things in The Dragon Tamers is there's a lot of jokes about how dragons are very like house cats. And so, of course, I'm look, looking at this book and listening to it, and I keep looking at Minerva and thinking, it is not wasted. So there is a picture of my house dragon. What I keep thinking is somebody posted a meme that said modern Tyrannosaurus Rex and showed a chicken. And I thought, yes, that's right. That's very possible. There is a theory that the Tyrannosaurus Rex is alive and well and walking among us as chickens, that it's just a, an advanced form of it. So I'd like to think if there were dragons, they're now house cats. And so there is Minerva sitting in her special place on old towels that are raggedy beyond use, but that she likes as her bed. And she's sitting in the window in the bathroom over the big soaking tub where I like to lie in the winter. And she's being a dragon. So it's always good to remember chickens may be evolved Tyrannosaurus rex and Minerva may be an evolved dragon. So I think that's all we've got for today. It was a rather quiet week. So let me remind you, as always, that there is still a pandemic on. We all still need to look out for each other and for the people who cannot be vaccinated. And remember, the whole point of this is always the same. You get your shot, you wear your mask, you socially distance, you wash your hands, because what we're all doing here together is the thing that we who listen to Cognitive have always advocated. Stay safe. Take care of each other. Keep talking to each other soon, and I'll talk to you soon, too. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the Blogspot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.